Hello everyone. So this is my uh, full obituary of um, Father Johnson. I've written a 10,000 word obituary of him and um, I, I publish a brief um, uh, spoken obituary on my channel just after I found out he died. So someone said, I wish that could be four times longer. Well, this would be far longer, but I think YouTube will only limit me to something like 25 minutes now. Um, so Reverend Father David Johnson, M.A. Cantab, was called to his reward on the 26th of April this year. 2020. Um, Father Johnson was 66. He was very troubled and a very troublesome uh, figure of fun, uh, and he really was uh, unique. He was a marvellous shit, and I mean both parts of that with equal sincerity. Uh, so his death in an Abingdon nursing home uh, ends a maelstrom of mirth, mischief, and malice. David uh, will be remembered as very unwise, very unholy, very dirty old man, and he was a priest in the Church of England. He was the most uh, scabrous, splenetic, squiffy, scapegrace, sybaritic, scandal-struck scoundrel uh, I ever met, and sacerdotal too. Um, David was so often uproariously funny and outrageously rude. His liver should be buried separately with full military honours. Um, his Rabelaisian Rod Montades and xenophobic screeds and waspish wit were inimitable. He often had us in stitches in the Oxford Union bar. He was the most irreverent, irreverent reverend you'd ever meet, but sometimes a parsimonious parson too. David liked to joke at anyone else's expense. He was sometimes the butt of jokes. So um, this obituary will continue in that spirit. Um, it's been, uh, someone said, brutal but exact. He was a priest who committed every sin of the Decalogue, except perhaps willful murder. Um, verily, David was the Anglican answer to a Borgia Pope. And the main consequence of his death is that the price um, of Guinness shares has plunged. He ought to have owned shares in St. James's Gate Brewery because he consumed copious quantities of its uh, product, which was um, astonishing considering he was knee high to a grasshopper and slight. So um, David Johnson was a um, puzzling and wearying amalgam of good and bad traits. And I shan't stint from showing him warts and all. He was a man of the most um, jaw-dropping and often offensive candour. So I will treat him the way he treated everyone else. I'm going to show the whole man, and that's why I put the bitch into obituary. Um, perhaps it's a good thing that uh, you beware any of those who breathe in terms of libel law. Now we can't sue me. But um, I don't know anything I'm going to say is untrue. But some of the stories um, I got from David, and those are the ones I doubt. Um, he lived his entire life as though it was a harlequinade of performance art. Now, there are those who say nil nisi bonum de mortuis, but I'm not one of those. David can scarcely be said to be an oversensitive, so um, I am going to speak about him candidly um, and his riotously funny life. He never pulled punches, so I shan't either. Uh, David often hit a man when he was down. He slagged people off about failing exams, about having children in different circumstances, about whatever, um, about unwise sexual encounters um, and things like that. So his Edwardian dress sense and studied mannerisms should be sorely missed. I can't remember what I was speaking to about years ago, about 15 years ago, and him turning to the side and like bowing every so often like that. Um, so yeah, it, it was bizarre, but it was just so um, David, so um, different, eccentric. He had many, many foibles. It was as though he lived his life as conscious self-parody. Was he playing up to the stereotype of the dirty vicar, like that Monty Python sketch? Um, it's as though he stepped from the pages of a Gilbert and Sullivan script. It made me think how Gilbert and Sullivan, they try to make the most unsuitable person possible become whatever it is. Um, Secretary of State for the Navy or for First Lord of the Admiralty, whatever it is, or later um, Major General. Um, so uh, he was completely unfit to be a clergyman, yet he wore the dog collar. He ought to be in a music hall impresario. So I'm offering um, my remembrances of this man who, who had virtues and vices on a grand scale. Um, and he did nothing by half measures. 
So over the past 10 days since his death, I've been reminiscing about him so much and calling to mind more and more memories. I feel like I was sort of a Boswell of his. Um, so despite being a, a priest, he was a man for whom the seven deadly sins appeared to be in his Ten Commandments. Envy, sloth, pride, vanity, uh, lechery, and a few others. These were a few of his favourite things. Uh, it is a minor miracle that the NHS managed to keep him alive after such a madcap career of um, sozzled iniquity. OK, that's a tautology. So he was born on the 5th of December 1953 in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, son of a small-time civil servant and a Scots housewife. Despite being um, half North British, he identified as completely South British. Uh, he has one sister and there's no chaleur between them. Um, his r relations with his parents appear to be um, cool as well. So um, David told me that when he was born, his father asked the doctor, does he have footballers' legs? Well, he didn't. And in this and other regards, he appears not to have measured up to his parents' aspirations for him. He was about five foot three and um, uh, spindly. So it must have been a sporting disaster. And presumably that was a cross to bear in football-obsessed Newcastle. Newcastle being one of the most macho towns in the United Kingdom. The Toon, as they call it. So the only anecdote he ever related to me of his childhood was when he was told they were going for a picnic and they got ready and packed up the hamper. At the last minute, they said they're cancelling it. Why? He was, he was gutted. It's to learn, teach you to cope with disappointment. So they seem to be that, that sort of mean-spirited, malicious parents, according to him. But anyway, even if that's not true, it speaks volumes about his relationship with his parents. That's the only uh, tale he ever related of his uh, childhood years. So it signifies a distinct lack of love for his parents. But um, many of these aperçus come from the horse's mouth, so I would take them with a fistful of salt. Um, anyway, David was seldom guilty of veracity. Um, if these stories are false, they still reveal much about this man. They are what he wanted us to believe, or maybe he fooled himself into believing them, or what he would like to have happened, uh, depending on the story. So he was brought up in a non-conformist um, church, and he found it um, judgmental, bland, and uninspiring. So he visited the Church of England, and it seemed life-affirming to him. He said it was full of everything um, colourful, cheerful, and positive. The music, the decor and so on appealed to him. He, he really went for optics, as you'll see in the rest of uh, this account of his life. So he remained a zealous Anglican for the rest of his days. Um, the evangelical uh, wing of Anglicanism didn't appeal much to him for its tendency to teetotalism. Um, and uh, I remember him taking the mick out of some uh, evangelicals praying over whatever, saying, there was a man with a short arm, so we rubbed that, we prayed over that arm, we rubbed that arm, and do you know, it grew. Or well, there was a woman with one leg shorter than the other. So we prayed over that leg. We rubbed that leg. And do you know, it grew. So David said, well, then I said to them, there was a man with a very short penis. So we prayed over that penis. We rubbed that penis. And do you know, it grew. So um, there he was taking the mick out of them. Um, so he went to Dame Allen's school. And most of the boys there spoke with mild Geordie accents, which you would do if you're bourgeois in Newcastle. But he affected this stratospherically posh accent. Uh, he claimed that that's because his, his, his headmaster was Churchill's aide-de-camp and his mother had been an elocution teacher in the BBC. So he sounded a bit more like a Dalek and had this sort of um, high-pitched, um, conceited duck voice, a little bit nasal. Hey, all right, I'm David Johnson. Callahan, how are you? You're bog Irish. They said, you're too drunk to come in here. Say, as a celibate priest, it came as a big surprise to me when I was woken up in the middle of the night by a burglar who said, your, your room is a fucking tip. Something like that. Um, anyway, he uh, was melodramatic and it was an endlessly creative character. Uh, he was like that for the rest of his life. He was forever reinventing himself and it was as though he was playing a part on stage. So much of his persona was performative. That's why it's difficult to peel back the layers and to know what was the real David underneath? Was there a real David? Had he become the act? Had he tricked himself into this? We shall, we shall never know. Anyway, he said his school textbooks were from the 1930s, which assured people there would never be a war because um, there was collective security. I remember him saying this, well, ha, bloody ha. Anyway, he grew up very much in the shadow of the Second World War and rationing was only just being phased out. Um, in his infancy. And so he was presumably aware that the many of his schoolfellows were the sons of veterans. His father had spent the war as a functionary. David said he was told, your duty lies here. So I wonder if that took quite a lot of living down. 
Uh, presumably he was bullied for it. I mean, he said the Geordies are the bravest of the lot. But he didn't lie about his, war, his father's war service, and that, that impressed me. It might have been tempting to lie. He could have got away with it. But my early adolescence, he must have been a homosexualist in self-understanding. Or should I say a homosexual? Um, he had, had a very camp voice. How much of a choice is it to be gay? Well, anyway, if he were hetero, I doubt he would be much of a hit of the ladies being um, the runt of the litter, you know, a midget and not, not, not physically prepossessing. But despite his diminutive stature, he never lacked for self-assurance. Was any of this um, small band syndrome? Just possibly. He was incredibly assertive, seemed to be brimming over with self-confidence. So undersized, queer, bookish and useless at games, he was apt to be bullied. And his father could have been dubbed a shirker during the war. And I wonder if much of his alcohol was himself medicating for this childhood angst and sorrow. In a rare moment of introspection, he once confided in me that um, no one had ever loved him. And in fairness, that seems to be he didn't, didn't love anyone either. But no familial love, no romantic love. He wasn't a very lovable person, I'm afraid. I know he inspired fierce loyalty into some people to this day. But uh, he, was, he would have been an unlikely... Lothario if he was straight. So in, in adolescence, he must have grown into being a lifelong alcoholic. Uh, he, he once can see concealed this from his parents, but he said, um, my mother never knew I drank till one night I came home sober. But he could put it away, he could absorb it despite his um small mass. Anyway, so David was accepted at Cambridge to read theology. He went up to Selwyn in 1973. And despite his lack of size and his modest social background, he was blessed with boundless uh, self-belief and a very forward nature, never bashful and never once. He threw himself into the Cambridge Union and that suited his talents to the T. He was already a, an accomplished debater. So David joined the Conservative Association or KUKA, as it's known to Cambridge. He was an ardent uh, monarchist and a sentimental imperialist. And at this stage, he um, well had already developed his, his lifelong devotion to the demon drink. He acquired a reputation being a crashing snob, a shameless social climber and an incorrigible name dropper. If he wanted to make a splash, well, he certainly succeeded. He was an incurable rapscallion and a japester right from the get-go. Be Bebito ergo sum appears to have been his uh, motto. So um, this was surely David's first opportunity to mix with la jeunesse dorée, because you wouldn't meet them in Newcastle back then. I imagine it was quite an eye-opener, because family finances would not have run to anything in the way of Dash. And his contrived upper class accent, I wonder if it started at Cambridge or before, probably there, would have got even more grief in Newcastle going around like that. So he spoke in the clipped cadences and lingering, languorous vowels of a 1940s newsreel, like British Parthé or something. So he had a reputation for being of a bent, well, bent. Um, homosexuality had been de decriminalised in 1967. Remember, he was he was 14 when that happened. So it was still very much disapproved of and an impediment to many careers, a sacking offence in many jobs. So as a Ganymede, he would have found his, some of his ilk at Cambridge. But the expression a raving homosexual might have, might have been invented for him. But despite his um, incessant filthy talk, he doesn't claim to have bedded many males or any females. So by his own admission, he was never scholarly, but he got through the course and it is um, holidays. He worked as a civil servant. It was a sort of virtuous tedium that he reviled. So David was always um, fond of playing pranks on people. He tricked some freshers into providing urine samples and placing them on the desk of an unpopular don, getting people to stand on one leg on some in the, the, the town square and processing down to the river cam to how to see a professor put one toe in the water and things like that. So the acme type of his time at Cambridge was his unopposed election as president of the Cambridge Union. And his opposite number at Oxford uh, was Benazir Bhutto, the future prime minister of Pakistan. Um, and according to himself, he came to know her quite well, was invited to a reception for her in London in the late 80s. So one exact contemporary of, of, of uh, David at um, Cambridge was, was Michael Portillo, a L London grammar school boy then at Peterhouse. Now, by the time I met David, Portillo was seen to be the great white hope of, of the Tory party. In fact, it didn't come to pass. But Portillo was completely anonymous at Cambridge, and David was honest about that. He'd never heard of Portillo till the 80s, because Portillo spent most of his time with his, um, with his um, Don he was having a gay relationship with. 
So as finals approached, David was told in advance that he was he, he they decided he was going to get a two two. He was never intellectual nor um a sedulous at study. So David he was more bibulous than bibliophile, and they couldn't very well fail twenty five percent of the people doing the subject. There were only four of them on the course. So this tale, like others, comes to courtesy of the late D. Johnson Esquire of happy and glorious memory. So as a real pissant, it might have been an uphill struggle to to. to secure a good degree. His sister was up at the same time as himself, and they spent no time together. She was a typical left-wing undergraduate, and apparently speaks in a, in a slight Geordie accent, as you'd expect. Um, she did not like his reactionary proclivities. Um, anyway, she went on to become a civil servant, and married, have two children. It was a life of quite blameless bourgeois domesticity, such as David found insufferable. Not for him, suffocating conformity. So um, he joined the church. He thought that might have been airless for him, but apparently not. Gave him scope. Um, in his early 20s, he was well on his, was already going down this well-worn path of being a young fogey. High church, high Tory, high camp, and he never once deviated from it. So he was a practising Anglican, but he seemed to be utterly devoid of Christian charity or morality. And the chaplain of Selwyn uh, was not a fan and completely disapproved of David's antics because he was notorious in the college. But the, the fortune of, so, so David wanted to go to the church, um, but uh, go to Cuddleston Theological College. Fortunately for David, the chaplain despised Cuddleston even more than he did David and therefore uh, provided with with a with a magnificent reference. So with this glowing letter of introduction, it did the trick. He secured his place at Cuddleston. Um, anyway, so he was going off to be to be a clergyman. An alcoholic catamite is uh, not quite what they might have been hoping for. Having said that, I don't know if he actually actually did engage in catamitism. He never said that he did anyway. Um, I don't think he had any penchant for buggery. And bearing in mind he was a young gay in London in the nineteen eighties, it's probably a good thing because that was the height of the AIDS crisis. So he went into the church, but why did he pick a clerical career? Um, it might have been the dressing up. I never met a man who's so thrilled to dress up. So the church offered him incomparable fashion opportunities. It's probable that he perceived an ecclesiastical career as a 40-year-long fancy dress party. It appealed greatly to the poseur and the showman in him. He adored the sound of his own voice. He never went to church except when he was leading worship, and the church guaranteed him an audience. David was an attention addict, and that explains his flamboyant sartorial style. Um, uh, so it would also be a comfortable berth for someone who may not have cut it in a more competitive career. So David seemed to be bereft of any genuine spirituality. He almost never talked about religion. If anyone brought it up, he'd say, oh, you're a religious nut, aren't you? Um, so, which was uh, richly ironic. That was the intention. He was the one wearing the dog collar, the soutane and the shovel hat while saying that. I suspect that religion bored him rigid. He would have considered Jesus a long-haired lefty drip. Um, in fact, I never heard him mention Jesus, and he seldom even alluded to God at all. So, meek and mild was not exactly David's style. He was never one to hide his light under a bushel, uh, no humility in him. Um, his reverence was as unchristlike as may be imagined. So, he was very much within the high Anglican um, faction of the church. The iconography and the nomenclature of Anglo Catholicism held an irresistible appeal for him. Uh, he was all right with latitudinarians, but he felt disdain for the low church. He scorned them as, as do gooders, as kids joys and loonies. He was scathing about them being so um, bigoted towards people of his sexual inclination, seeing people like him as deviant. Anyway, it was the frippery, the social status and the performance aspects of um, being a clergyman that gratify David. The church held an unparalleled um, appeal for him, a man of such raging vanity and irrepressible theatricality. So he was, he was so often melodramatic in the way he carried himself and what he wore, in the things he said, uh, more at his tone of voice, and on and on. So he craved an audience, and um, he was uh, just so gregarious. So the church provided him with his stage to project his self-importance, and allowed him ample scope to pursue his ruling passions, alcoholism, and homosexual ribaldry. Anyway, if David worshipped any deities, it was it was uh, Dionysus and Mammon. There was a grace of, of his college which said, May the boys of this college all be learned, wise, and sober virgins. 
Um, now, David was never learned, wise, sober or virginal. That wouldn't that wouldn't describe him at all. So Cuddeston is just outside Oxford, that theological college. He spent two years there because he already had a degree in theology. So there was no fire alarm. He was fire walking at night at Cuddeston. And he liked to ring the um, alarm bell, even if there was no fire, um, three in the morning. And people would would pile out of bed and run out in case it was a fire. There'd be eight bedrooms, single bedrooms down this corridor. How come 12 young men were running out? Because the all-male students were bed hopping, according to himself. So David was openly gay in middle age, but it seems he never had a boyfriend. He once vouched says to me that he'd been to a male brothel in the 1980s. I asked him if he, had, if he ever had. He said, OK, I have. He said he found met young men there of all colours, shapes and sizes. Didn't tell me what he got up to. When I asked him about it another day, I said, no, it wasn't me, another priest. And I distinctly recall he said another, not another. Um, anyway, in the 2000s, David told me, I don't have sex because it destroys relationships. It creates all sorts of petty jealousies and tensions. Um, he acknowledged sharing a bed with men from time to time. And you wake up in the morning and it's just nice to wank off. So he appears to not have had a predilection for buggery. Anyway, in the 1970s, he presumably had to be discreet about his, his uh, orientation. That would have been rather politique. And um, they would have been frowned upon as a perverse proctological proclivity. Homosexuality was seen as deviancy um, at that time. And in 2000, he said that a third of Anglican clergy were gay. And that's usually a, surely a huge overestimate. For David, gaiety and gayness um, came together. He was self-confessedly as queer as a three-pound note. David was very much the homosexual's homosexual. Did I mention that he was gay? Anyway, so when the church told him to convert the heathen, he misheard that as to pervert the heathen. Um, anyway, uh, he... Um, he pursued that with missionary zeal, but despite not being a transvestite, there was something undoubtedly effeminate about his manner, his timbre, his movement, his fixation with garments, and it was all unmanly. So then he went down to London. He was ordained um, a deacon. That's a way station towards becoming a priest. He successfully ordained as a priest. He continued his life's mission of vulgarity, venality, alcoholism and Buggery. OK, probably not buggery, but I just like saying it. Buggery. Um, David was not just homosexual. He was also homosocial. He didn't appear to have any female friends. The only exception was was uh, Christine Hamilton. He said he would have very much liked to have married Christine Hamilton. But he said but he did marry her to Neil. Um, indeed, so he performed the, the wedding ceremony of one of the most famous couples in Britain. And I met I met them through him. And there were other things like um, they were actually quite famous around 2000. Neil Hamilton, former, former Tory MP. And there were other things about those two. I can't think what it is now. Um, yeah, they were they were on, on desire and television. He said they don't want to be a circus act. But he was a bit of a circus act himself. So Christine was very much a domineering sort. Did he want a dominatrix? Possibly. Does it say something about his relationship with his mother? Maybe. So I never heard him express admiration for women's looks, even the aesthetic sense. He really was a 24 carat gay, but Pharisaism was not one of his besetting sins. So it was a matter of, of much amusement when some of his Canterbridgean contemporaries were struggling to make it in London. These were men of thrusting ambition who found themselves underperforming, not residing in the shishi boroughs. And they're forced by peculiar circumstances to subside in London's less salubrious districts. David skewered them by saying they pronounced Clapham as Clam to pretend it was as posher, or Stockwell as St. Oakwell. And remember, in the 70s, it wasn't expensive to live even in the centre of London. So some of his Cambridge friends started to get engaged. And in those days, a man could only become a fiance to a female of the species. So David had assumed that some of his circle were not the marrying type in the parlance of those lavender days. But um, when a man who was assumed to be a confirmed bachelor became plighted to a young lady, David would cynically express his surprise, thinking the guy's actually gay. He said, you give them an umbrella as a wedding present. Um, I don't know what the symbolism of that is. In 1977, he celebrated the Silver Jubilee, the Queen's 25th anniversary as Queen, and his local publican was an Irish Republican. Despite that, he bedecked his, his establishment and union flags. David was ever the passionate monarchist. So in the 80s, he was working at Church House. It was the nexus of the Church of England. He handled relations with the Catholic Church and the black churches, or, or as David said, papes and nigs. 
David was not to be accused of cultural sensitivity. He referred to the Roman Catholic Church as the Italian mission to the Irish in this country. Or, as he said, the Italians preach Catholicism, but the Irish believed it. So one of his party pieces was to sing, Do in the Vatican rag, get down your, your knees and fiddle with bees, and genuflect, 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 by, by Tom Lehrer. So he was a reactionary provocateur. Um, so David claimed to have been a chaplain to the Brigade of Guards. I served with, but not in. He was honest enough not, not, not to pretend to be a proper army padre, and, and he hero-worshipped them. Um, I'm sure that David was an ornament to the Brigade of Guards. He remarked that the Irish Guards are the most fun of all the, the regiments of the household division. And when attempting to enter the officer's mess, a sergeant quipped in a strong Irish brogue, you're not drunk enough to go in here. Um, anyway, it's astonishing that a man with such an insatiable taste for booze didn't do himself more harm sooner. Bearing in mind he weighed like eight stone ringing wet. Uh, his capacity to, to consume a lot of alcohol without getting blind drunk was staggering. Shows you how hardened he was to it. His reverence spent some time in Rome, and he was thrilled to be presented to His Holiness the Pope, that was John Paul II in those days. The grand eloquence and the sartorial pretentiousness of the Catholic Church must have proved almost irresistible. He must have fantasised about donning the jupe of um, uh, scarlet silk, Soutane, and uh, riding side saddle up the Quirinial Hill as a cardinal, a prince of the church. But being born aloft in the sedia gestatoria would have been his wet dream. Did he even aspire to rise to the throne of St. Peter? So mortification of the flesh and modesty were not for David. So eventually he went to have a parish in Leicestershire. He had to drive around, but his alcohol abuse became unmanageable. He was repeatedly pulled over by the local constabulary. And as he said, the magistrates and I agreed that I wouldn't drive anymore. So David was unashamed of his dipsomania. Now, cottaging for the occasional blowjob can not have endeared David to his parishioners. Um, it's discombobulating to be propositioned by a man of the cloth, particularly if you're touching cloth. But maybe he was there seeking his, his, his flock or persuading young men to turn away from sin. But seeking rough trade in a public lavatory is not considered exemplary conduct in the church. Uh, anyway, on the issue of same-sex attraction, David was not a hypocrite. He scorned those who engaged in queer bashing. And he noted that, yes, books of the Bible says homosexuality is forbidden. They also permit slavery or say you get, you get executed for wearing clothes in more than one fibre. But nobody defends those things any longer. So he invited the Right Honourable um, John Enoch Pearl to preach at his church. David referred to, to Pearl as the prophet. It was less than 20 years since Pearl's rivers of blood tirade. And nearby Leicester had a large Indian immigrant minority. So some thought that Powell would, would, heap on, would, would harp on about immigration. We never mentioned it. It was the only Sunday the church was packed. And um, the sermon was recorded and David listened to it later. So there was not a single um, not a single uh, because Powell would say, well, how else is there to speak? Um, so uh, there was a dinner for, for Powell who stayed over and... and um, uh, Johnson, who loved cooking, called himself, I never knew him to cook anything, he said he hired a butler and cook to serve because he didn't want to miss a moment of the conversation. David later fantasised that, um, so as he later said that when another Tory MP came to preach, um, only five people came and they were all my servants. I remember saying that in Alcaport and Policy. So he liked to imagine that he was uh, a 19th century vicar from a landed family. So he was colourblind from birth, and this once got him into to, to, um, uh, trouble, this debility. He bought an RAF overcoat insignia removed from an army surplus shop, and he went to France to represent the Church of England at a conference. On returning to the UK, he took the train home, and a man aboard the choo-choo came up to him and said, I think it's fucking disgusting when bastards like you wear that coat. David suspected he was accused of being wearing an RAF coat, which is not entitled. So David defended himself and said, uh, I shall have you know that I used to be a chaplain at RAF Abingdon. I am entitled to wear this overcoat. And the bloke said, I I'm an expert in Second World War memorabilia. That's an SS overcoat. And David said, no, uh, this is navy blue. And the man said, are you blind? That's black. It's not navy blue. Anyway. In the early 90s, he cultivated a beard, which was trimmed to be a George V one. Sitting in the Oxford and Cambridge Club one day, someone um, loudly remarked, these fucking Jews get everywhere. So the Church of England um, started um, ordaining women, and David was adamantine in his opposition to this. Um, 
But when the change came, this confirmed misogynist did not cross the Tiber. Why didn't he become a Catholic? He's saying, I don't want to play second fiddle to Father Seamus O. Pig. Um, his contribution to world literature was the spiritual quest of Francis Wagstaff, and this character is a member of the Catholic Church, CK, the old Catholic Church. It consists of silly letters to various public figures, particularly ecclesiastical ones. Wagstaff is, was a figment of, of David's mischievous imagination, and people replied to Wagstaff as being to be a real person. It was his his magnum opus was was iconoclastic, and um, asking him for a bishop a bishop where he buys his toupee and the guy writes back saying my hair is all my own, and Wagstaff says surely Christian charity comes before personal vanity. In another epistle, he go um, Wagstaff writes to a bishop saying I met Shag O'Reilly who knew you when you were in the navy. Shaggy says you're a bit of a short ass. Forgive the serviceman's slang. It carries on in that vein. Um, so the vicar once celebrated a um, uh, wedding and the couple had been living in sin for some time beforehand. He'd obviously dined well before he conducted the marriage ceremony. And I now pronounce your man a wife. So may I kiss the bride? He says, why not? You've been fucking her for three years. Anyway, um, so in the 90s, David's antics were brought to the attention of the bishop. His bad language and his over-drinking were becoming a problem. It requires a great deal of finesse to be a country vicar, and he did not handle these things well. Um, he was just so insensitive. I received a phone, a voicemail from him at one time, garbled like this. Oh, hello, George. Edmund Sutton died on New Year's Day. Goodbye. Like, don't break it to people gently. Um, he just didn't have the manner for these things and didn't care to handle these things delicately. Um, so he was lent upon to retire upon, upon health grounds. He was 42. Ill health was a code word for raging alcoholism. But stuffing his mouth with gold did not work. He kept blabbing about scandals, scandals in the church. He said John Witheridge was a frightful shit. He had been chaplain to the, to, the, to the Archbishop of Canterbury, later headmaster at Charterhouse. So the church was trying to help him dry out. He was sent to a clinic to give up alcohol. Part of his rehabilitation course was going to a pub and learning to say no. But then he said the trouble is every every pub in Leicestershire, he would just walk in the door, they'd immediately start pulling a Guinness because they knew his order like that. He was so widely recognised. So they would do it unbidden. So it was positively juvenile to put out to grass. You wouldn't get that now. A house in Oxford and a fat pension at 42. I mean, he had it made. Um, so the Church of England gave him this house to live in for free, which uh, with his typical perversity, he called Seaview Cottage. It wasn't a cottage and it was over 50 miles from the sea. Why did he choose to live there? Say, so I wasn't going back to Cambridge, not being a professional old boy. Well, Oxford was virtually the same thing. It was a convivial city full of like minded people. Never once did he voice any gratitude for this unexampled liberality of the settlement that the church had granted him. If the church believed by retiring David, he would mellow with age. It was sorely mistaken. David had not the slightest intention of toning down his lifestyle. He blazed a trail for every reprobate. So the Reverend carried on his harem scarum existence. And did he give up drink? He, no way. Far from it. He was very seldom stable. And he perhaps once disgraced himself by appearing in public sober. So this porter-soaked pop and jay washed up in Oxford, and in terms of opera buffa, he was just beginning. His inventiveness, his energy, and his meanness knew no bounds. Um, his persiflage was too much for many, so he wasn't to everyone's taste. Another Anglican said to me the right thing to do for the church was to unfrock David in the mid-90s. The church wanted to avoid the embarrassing headlines, but they simply should have taken on the chin rather than the shame of this loon traipsing around in, in, in his clericals, regaling people with, with, with scatological stories and racist epithets and getting drunk in public and dragging their name through the mire every single day. So I knew one Anglican who crossed the Tiber, partly because of David, saying, if this is the Church of England, I want no part of it. So David was completely unpriestly. The Church of England was constantly left with egg on its face because of these racist greeds and his perverse sexual rantings. People did not expect to meet a clergyman who was drinking them under the table. But he was an indefatigable evangelist. He preached a gospel of sodomy and sybaritism, and he found fertile ground in Oxford for his unique brand of Anglicanism. Um, it was no, in no small measure down to David that the Oxford Union became the most outrageous gay bar in Britain. Um, it was as though David was uh, really <laughs> trying to put people off. He had a pre he was a priest of the penchant for every vice. Um, anyway, he was <laughs> sordid, a bon vivant, but he was in the church for himself. 
he claimed he, on, on Victory Over Japan Day, 1995, he went to a Japanese uh, restaurant and the waiter said, well, well, we'd like it. David said, an apology. Um, anyway, he was known to refer to the Japanese as snub-nosed, slit-eyed, little yellow bastards. Now, he could not in truth be called politically correct. He was pretty short himself. Was he actually anti-Japanese? I think he was just doing it for, for, for giggles. Um, so David, he sought out posh freshers. In his 40s, he had friends age 19. He liked an ingenue, and he never lost his, his, his predilection for posh puffs. But he had hetero friends too. He went weak at the knees for a peer of the realm. His, rever his reverence made a beeline for old Etonians. I can't help surmising he dearly wished he'd been there. But he didn't lie about his origins. So be, un be understood, he was not predatory. He was not a pederast. He mostly got off on, 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 on simply talking dirty to adults. His vice was liquor and not licking. Um, so David was um, someone who set his face like flint against female clergy. And at Oxford, the church put him under the superintendence of a woman priest. And David took it as a calculated insult. Um, even he had to admit that Rosie was, was reasonable and competent. Yet he scornfully called her the priestess. But she did not object to being a sot and a sod. So luncheon found vicar in the alehouse. It was a liquid lunch usually. He passed the remainder of the day cruising from one licensed establishment to the next. Along with that, he would fortify himself with liberal swigs from his hip flask full of whiskey. He was indeed a boozy beggar, but he was not always sloshed. He did not often get drunk, but he just never got sober. He could stick it away. Decades of heroic drinking meant that he could outconsume a man twice his size and not be visibly under the influence. He was inured to it. He was not permanently pissed because he only drank the juice of the barley when awake. So the Reverend Father took a lively interest in what he unironically called colonial affairs. And his favourite president of Zimbabwe was the Reverend Canaan Banana, partly because he was a churchman, partly because of his cartoonish name, but Bananas being as bent as a banana was another plus. So the vicar addressed the Oxford Union saying, Teddy Blair invited me to Downing Street. He said, Dave, you've done more than anyone else to take alcoholism, foul language, and sexual deviancy off the streets and put them back into the church where they belong. So um, he never objected to being identified as a beery swine. Indeed, he, he reveled in it. Nay, he was proud of it all. So it was a life of the most unexampled iniquity. Um, he spoke about some MPs because he knew a few of them, um, like that guy for King's Lynn, I forget his name, uh, Henry Bellingham. So on one occasion, I introduced him to my brother-in-law, said, it's my brother-in-law, James. The next day, he called me, said he spent all night leafing through Burke's peerage, trying to find out which peer of the realm has the same surname as me. And he misheard it as my brother, Lord James, not in-law. So he was always kowtowing to the nobility, tugging the forelock. I introduced him to Countess Tolstoy. He took a hand and he gracefully executed a deep bow. And never have I witnessed such an obtrusive display of deference towards a peeress even when stocious um well any type of his conscience he was unfailingly obeisant towards the the titled perhaps he could feel that he could get away with being epicurean if he was like deferential towards the upper orders so remember in 1999 was just before i came up there was a ball the notorious seafood incident mr seafood i um, won't give his real name um was so seafood was 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 oysters were left in front of a of, of radiator for several hours before being served, and people un, unwittingly ate these, and the results are better not described. But David fell victim to food poisoning, so he decided to exact vengeance upon the witless boy who had accidentally done this to him. So uh, Jono sent a parcel to the Oxford Union, to said to be opened by the secretary personal strictly only to be opened by the secretary but the house manager heedless of this unwisely opened it put his hand in and felt something like solid and well maybe a bit wet squelching in between his fingers what the fuck was that it was feces anyway there was an overpowering stench david said sent in his shitty underpants i later asked him if he'd sent in his diarrhea stained y fronts and he said they were slightly soiled <laughs> grinning wickedly <laughs> anyway it was just so typically david just like wow inimitable so in 1999 he held a big celebration of the 20th anniversary of his ordination he's always saying were you at my 20th no i wasn't so by this stage he was it was already a well-recognized oxford character he was a legend amongst the alkaloons 
I, I idolized him. His acolytes were often treated to a repertoire of his stories. Not everyone was a, a, a enamored of this middle-aged adolescent, his foul-mouthedness, his alcoholic antics, and all the rest of it. Um, the late Anthony James said to me of David, he is a warning. You don't want to end up like that. So David was had not grown out of freshers' week, and he was known to his followers as the vicar of Cowley, and I was one of his disciples. So Alc appointed him the dean, what in charge of discipline. If they're hoping that Father Johnson was a father figure, they were to be disappointed. He often attended Port and Policy. We were treated by, to a racist rant by a man of the dog collar. In, in 2010, Alc was striving to shake off his bad image. David simply had to spoil this. A journalist asked him how Alc had reformed, and David said, We are very inclusive in Alc these days. Look at this boy here. He's Welsh, but we let him in anyway. So he was probably not even a crapulous state when he said that. In December 1999, it was the, the farewell debate, the only sort of debate he ever got to speak at, the last one of the, the term. And he had a very listenable um, tenor voice. And he, he, he sang, I was a fair young curate then. He carried it off with aplomb. Apart from his voice, the only instrument he played was the pink oboe. And when he'd been uh, president of the Cambridge Union, there was a tradition whereby um, for the farewell debate, the Oxonians would go over to Cambridge and they would kidnap the president of the Cambridge Union, complete with water pistols in public, drive him over to Oxford, be kept well, well provided with food and drink, and then put him in a supermarket trolley tied up. And the climax of the debate would he be pushed in in triumph to the debating chamber. As a wag, David liked writing satirical letters to national publications. The Telegraph published a letter he put of his saying he was joint master of the Cowley sewer beagles because he lived in Cowley, or Cowley Road to be more accurate. Um, but like Tony Benn, he immatured with age. So the reprobate bait never grew out of the um, puerile desire to create shockwaves and feel them reverberating back to him. Anyway, I've done like 40 minutes. I'm not quite halfway through. So I think I'll leave it there for tonight. More of dear old David Johnson on another occasion.